It's time for Windows Weekly. It is it's becoming an annual tradition, and we're thrilled. Microsoft's Chief Marketing Officer, Chris Capicella, joins us next on Windows Weekly. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Windows Weekly is provided by CashFly at C-A-C-H-E. FLY dot com. This is Windows Weekly, episode 549, recorded Wednesday, December 20th, 2017. Our yearly visit with Chris Capicella. Windows Weekly is brought to you by GoToWebinar, a trusted webinar platform with over 55,000 customers who have hosted over 2.7 million interactive web events to connect with their audiences. For more information, visit GoToWebinar.com slash podcast. And by Rocket Mortgage from Quicken Loans. Home plays a big role in your life. That's why Quicken Loans created Rocket Mortgage. It lets you apply simply and understand the entire mortgage process fully. So you can be confident you're getting the right mortgage for you. Get started at rocketmortgage.com slash windows. It's time for Windows Weekly, the show where we get together and discuss Windows Weekly. And I'm sad to say the last show of 2017. What a year this has been. What some strange hosts I'm in. <laughs> Why, it's almost like Mary Jo Foley. <laughs> Hello, Mary Jo Foley from all about Microsoft.com, the ZDNet blog. Good to see you. Merry Thanks, Christmas. You too. Yeah. Thanks. You're still home. Still here for now. For now. Yep. That's uh, five days till the Christmas celebration. Hanukkah just wrapping up. Yeah. Uh, Paul Therat's also here. Our, our own personal little Scrooge. <laughs> <laughs> Therat.com. T H U R R O double good.com. Listen, Cratchit. <laughs> <laughs> That's the Therat I know and love. <laughs> <clears throat> are we going to do, everybody's wanting to know, everybody, inquiring minds want to know, are we going to do what we've done two years running uh -oh. on, on the last show of the year? Do you know what I'm talking about? I do know what you're talking about. Is Mr. We Capicella? Are. We are? Yes! Yes! <laughs> Yay! So uh, yeah. Microsoft uh, CMO Chris Capicella will join us in a little bit. That's exciting. Yes. Yep. That's exciting. We're going to grill that guy like there's no tomorrow. <laughs> Don't let Phillies fans see you use that Boston Red Sox cup, Paul. No. There's no such thing as a Phillies fan, Leo. You know that. <laughs> the Phillies fan hey. addict. Look at that. Look at that. This is <laughs> not just a Boston Red Sox mug. It's massive. This is like my mug's yeah. bigger than yours. Yeah. I, I, as a Red Sox fan, I do feel the need to overcompensate. <laughs> the green monster. Uh, before we get to uh, Chris, and I know you have many questions for him, and I always, he's so great because uh, here's a guy who, you know, I mean, a CMO of, of, of major corporations, usually they're fairly guarded. And here's a guy who's just really straight, and, and I just love yep. talking to him. So we will uh, we'll have some questions for him in just a bit. But now we are learning what Redstone, what is it, Redstone 2 is? What do they call it? Four. Four? Four. Four. I don't even know. <laughs> Redstone 4, which will be the spring update. Whatever it's called, yeah. <laughs> well, well, but, well, what will it be called? We don't know still, which yeah, is that's, crazy. By the way, that's the right. question du jour. I know. So you're just going to make up a name. Yeah, we just keep calling it Redstone 4. Um, sometimes we call it 1803 because it's supposed to be RTM'd around March right. 2018. Right. But the reason we wanted to talk about it a little bit today is yesterday, after having no builds for a couple weeks, Microsoft dropped a giant test build Ooh. of this. Yeah. 17063. Well, it has a lot of stuff in it. As Paul said in the yeah, notes, so, a metric ton of stuff. <laughs> a metric ton, yeah. Well, no, I mean, I, I, this release is different in many, many ways. And yeah. one of the big ones for us, people who kind of cover Microsoft for a living, is that they never had an event where they described what the name is and what it constitutes. And a few weeks back, uh, Terry Myerson sent out an email to insiders to tell them about two of the big features, uh, sets and timeline, which may or may not make this release, which is another new thing. And 
I feel like, and I think we've discussed this maybe, that this Big Bang release that we just saw is kind of taking the place of that. This is mm. probably representative of the release. This may be what we're getting. Yeah. It's a lot of stuff. It is. So, yeah, timeline is in there. The the mm -hmm. the feature that um, helps you pick off pick up where you left off. It's an extension of the task view in Windows 10. They mm -hmm. promised that this would be in this build, and it is. And some people are getting sets as well. The Windows management thing where you can group tabs together. So far, only right. very limited number of apps. But uh, I did see some people saying on Twitter yesterday they, they had sets. Um, so those are the two biggest not. things. You don't? I did do you not. actually get the build installed finally? <laughs> well, I know as you I uh, noted on Twitter, so far the score is build 17063 to <laughs> Paul Zero. But what I did since yeah. then was... The, the computer I did get it installed on, which doesn't work properly, it's treating it like all of my applications are protected by Windows Defender Application Card or whatever mm -hmm. that's called. Yeah. Um, I just did a reset. Actually, I haven't, even, I haven't tried it since then. So I just before the show started, I did a reset. And yeah. I think it's okay. But maybe I shouldn't think that because who knows <laughs> if it's okay. So actually, I know. <laughs> maybe I should look. <laughs> I don't know. You should look and see if you have mm. sets. I'm curious if you... It, oh, I am curious sets. if they, I'm sorry. Oh, yeah, you don't. That I know. I don't. You definitely I don't. don't. Okay. No. I'll, I'll um, be adding it. Let's just say. You'll be adding it somehow in some way. Yeah, somehow. Uh, yeah, but there's other stuff too. There's a lot of new um, Windows subsystem for Linux features in this. There's lots of that fluent, blurry transparency stuff in there. So, um, sorry to they, interrupt, but um, it yes. still has the same block. I can't use it. The build is unusable. You, really? Oh, yep. man. I, What's I, that? What PC what is this? What are you talking about? It's what, a, this what one's PC? a Surface Pro. I couldn't get really? it installed on an HP Spectre X360. What happens is I try to run like command line, for example, yeah. and it comes up with a dialogue that says, your organization used Windows Defender application control to block this app. <laughs> Contact your support person for more info. Just to be clear, <laughs> um, I signed in with a local account. I'm not using an MSA or an Office 365, Azure AD account, whatever. It just doesn't work. Very <laughs> so, Joe, did you mess with his computer? Yeah, you know, I just <laughs> thought it's, this might be kind of fun. Actually, uh, some, somebody's pointing me to a tweet from Donna Sarkar that said, "For FYI, for people having trouble installing this build, and there's some um, suggestions around removing peripherals and others turned off device installation settings to no, and then the install would complete. I don't know if any of these would help you. Probably not given what you're doing. Hmm. But yeah, it's so it's not going smoothly for everyone, but some people are getting this and getting to see all the all these things. Uh, what else was in there? So lots of new Fluent stuff, redesign settings app. Um, Windows subsystem for Linux gets a whole bunch of new features. Uh, oh, and here's, this one was a good find that Paul saw. Edge now supports service workers by default, which means here comes progressive web apps. Yep. So that's in this build is uh, the foundation for Microsoft supporting progressive web apps. And their post yeah. on this yesterday said, we'll be saying a lot more about this in the coming weeks. So that's in there. Um, some new should, things with I, Cortana. Like there's like a lot of fit and finish polish, but then... Sets timeline, Windows subsystem for Linux, some really big things too. You look concerned. You're still not working. Yeah, I'm just, <laughs> I, I was telling Raphael today that um, this is how I lose days, you know, yeah. well, this in Call of Duty, in the sense that um, it takes a while to get the stuff working. In some cases, I, I yeah. so I have three computers in front of me, all of which I've attempted to install this thing on, none of which it has worked on. And mm. uh, it's, it's getting it's getting problematic. Yeah. <laughs> so I will, yeah. uh, I obviously I can't troubleshoot any of this on the show. So, mm. you know, by the time, uh, we're done here, it's going to be four, four thirty in the afternoon and I've spent all yeah. day on this. I mean, it's, I it's know. ludicrous. Yeah. That's so I don't know. Yeah. So I, I would say if you're somebody who is in the fast ring or skip ahead ring and you've heard about this build, go read the notes and there's like pages and pages of notes about this build. In, and there's also a separate Windows Insiders post from Brandon LeBlanc about um, sets specifically. So some more some more additional detail on what they've got in sets now and what's coming in sets. 
in terms of the kinds of apps that are supported and the way tabs work. So there, there's a lot of stuff. This, if you're if you're looking at this as your holiday present, you have a few days to unpack this if you can ever get it installed, like Paul. <laughs> so despite <laughs> my inability to rise to the standard of a typical beta tester, I would say that sets and timeline in particular are actually yeah. incredible major new features. And I've you know complained over the past couple of releases that some of the stuff they put in there doesn't necessarily impact a lot of people, but actually. Yeah. I feel that both of these things are super important and they both touch on uh, productivity, multitasking, whatever. Yeah. Um, and I think will impact everybody. And, you know, I think everybody knows or a lot of people know that in Windows 10, the initial version, they shipped a virtual desktop feature, um, which is useful for power users, but actually has major limitations for any user who tries to use it and uh, is not uh, approachable or discoverable by normal people. I don't think anyone mm -hmm. like many mainstream users would ever use this feature. Mm -hmm. um, timeline puts that on its head kind of, and it's kind of the opposite. It's both discoverable and usable and approachable by mainstream users. And unlike uh, virtual desktops, it's persistent and it's persistent across devices, which is maybe the most exciting bit. So we don't see the mobile half of the equation today, but Timeline will be available on your uh, phones as well. And that means you could bring up you know, Cortana or uh, OneDrive or Microsoft Word or whatever it is on your phone and you'll get a little pop-up of some kind. We don't know what this looks like yet. This is, hey, you were working on this activity yesterday. Do you want to continue that here? Because you have some apps that can run, you know, load those documents or whatever you were working on. Um, this is this is big stuff. I mean, I, I yeah. this is legit useful productivity enhancements to Windows. It's kind of the opposite of the baloney that I've complained about in the past. And that's nice. And a little bonus for you IT pros, they threw this in the post too, Windows Defender Application Guard, the thing that uh, isolates That's malware and exploits. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that thing that Paul is bugging Paul. They're oh, it works going great, to folks. Make, Let me tell you, you right. can't run anything. <laughs> it's been an enterprise-only feature, but yeah. with this update as, as of this build, it's now yep. also in pro, which is I very can nice. confirm it. It's there. It's there. You see it. Yeah. <laughs> oh, well. Yay. <laughs> it's super effective. <laughs> too effective. A little too effective. Yeah. So yeah, this is all this is all got dropped yesterday. Fast uh, ring. For though. fast ring. Fast ring. Fast ring. Yep. yep. Skip ahead and fast. What? Skip ahead? Skip ahead. Oh. Remember skip ahead ring? They still have that. Skip ahead is the sequel to cuphead. Yeah, that's what I was <laughs> It saying. is. Yeah. Skip ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Skip, skip ahead and mug man. <laughs> <laughs> All right, cool. cool. Yeah, cool, cool. Um, Google Chrome is now in the App Store. Then it's not. This, yeah, this story is crazy. I don't even um, know why Google thought this was a good idea. Well, so the the funny thing is, you know, Mahedi pinged me in the morning. I think it was yesterday, and he said, "Should you know?" He's like, "Do you think I should write this up?" And I assumed that. The, this little Google Chrome installer thing that was in the store was some third-party homebred, you know, some kid in a basement wrote it. And I'm like, no, this is, what are you talking about? And then, you know, everyone's writing about it. And I kind of looked at it a little closer and it was like, wait, this is, Google made this? <laughs> are you serious? <laughs> so anyway, we obviously we wrote about it. But then hilarity ensued. Yeah. Microsoft yeah. Uh, pulled it from the pulled store. I know. So it was just, just a stub that just we, loaded. It just it didn't do anything. No, it took yeah. you to. It opened. It opened the download page in your in your that's, default browser. That's basically. like that's like teenage I, I stuff. They it's, knew that would be yanked. Okay, so so I, I kind of. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, I was going to say, but Microsoft must have approved it, right? That's right. I mean, it's the only way it gets it didn't in the just store. show up in the store by you know, itself. These approvals, you know, we've seen now <laughs> Apple, for instance, two in a row, yeah. uh, phony yeah. versions of popular programs. One was Cuphead. Yeah. Right. Uh, so these are. I think what's happening is you're getting such m so many uh, mm -hmm. new apps now that mm -hmm. approvals have to be somewhat automated, right? Yeah, so I honest. think that's what happened. Yeah. But geez, you'd think an yeah. alarm would go off if you saw a Google app. Well, okay, so the, the narrative on why this app was pulled is kind of interesting to me because um, when I first heard that it was pulled, people were writing that, you know, Google had seen the feedback and realized it was super negative and it was like they had pulled the app from the store. That didn't happen. Oh. 
Um, although I joked at the time, you know, it was like, you know, uh, Google uh, would announce to kind of the Windows community and say, you know, guys, we've heard you clamoring for our apps in the store and we finally put one in there and then you reacted this way. So congratulations. <laughs> we'll just ignore this platform, you know. Um, then I read someone said something to the tune of, you know, that Microsoft, uh, realizing that this app was baloney, pulled it because it didn't do anything. And, and that there's Microsoft doing the right thing, to which I would reply to what, you know, the way Mary Jo just described, which is Microsoft approved it in the first place. I know. But here's the thing. <laughs> yeah. Apparently, it was pulled because Microsoft does not allow that kind of app in the store, uh, yeah. an app that is nothing but a front end to an installer. And if you, uh, I think we all agree that they are probably automating these um, store approvals. So Google is obviously on a AAA list somewhere. I mean, if, if Google comes in with an app to the store, I would think that Microsoft would have an automated process that would just approve that app because Google is not going to put something malicious in the store. But mm. after looking at it, you know, after a human <laughs> looked at it, they realized, actually, this thing doesn't meet our requirements uh, right. for an app, uh, for a store app. So here we are. We had a fun, okay, we have like three, four hours of this thing in the store, whatever it yeah. was. But the, so my question is, why did Google do it? And why yes. did they do it now? That's right. Like or, there's got to be more. they know more. and when did they know it? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yes. Right? Because Mary Jo, maybe. Mary jo, I, have a, I have a hint. Yes. You need to yes. follow the money. <laughs> I know. Right. Right. I mean, part of me says they just wanted to give them a little poke before the end of the year. Like, ha, ha, Merry Christmas. just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> sure. yeah. But then. You know, I've heard I heard one person say it's because there are so many um, clones of Google Chrome in the Microsoft Store that it was like getting hard for people to figure out what was real and what wasn't. That's I don't not, know if I really buy that. Um, I don't I, know, but look, I'm curious. Uh, yeah. I don't know if this makes sense for Google or not. But if you if you think about making a version of Chrome that is to Windows 10 and 10s, what um, you know Chrome is on iOS, what edges on Android or iOS. In other words, yeah. yeah, okay, we have to use the underlying web engine that in this case will be Edge. Well, that's fine. I mean, Edge renders text very well, the graphics, whatever, the web, it's great. What I want from a Chrome on Windows 10 is the same as what I want from a Chrome on iOS. I want syncing of my bookmarks, of my settings, my passwords. I just want the thing to work. As long as the underlying browser is okay, I, I couldn't care less what, what the rendering engine was. I'm yeah. okay with all that stuff. So is does that make sense for Google? No, we haven't no. seen that product. Google here, has but its I own engine. I kind of wish they would do They're I know, but I wish they would edge. do this. Like mm -hmm. when you think about Microsoft Edge on mobile, that browser is not using the Edge rendering engine. Now on Windows, that rendering engine is allegedly one of its biggest advantages. But mm -hmm. I don't mind using the underlying web yeah. rendering engine of the platform on any platform. And that's true on right. Windows 10 as well. And so... Well, does Chrome uh, on iOS use WebKit? I think it probably does. Yeah, Apple does. has the same yeah. rules. Yep. So That's what I'm saying. Now, yeah. it's a little more complicated on the desktop because one of the big advantages of Chrome is extensions. And I suspect getting those extensions into an Edge-based version of Chrome is either impossible or very difficult. And so that's obviously a huge concern, but I'd still take it, you know, I'd still, yeah. like if I, I would, I'd be happy to have that thing. Okay. Wait, um, here's, here's something I haven't seen that somebody mm -hmm. who's listening, Isaac Daly just forwarded on Twitter. He said, look at what this Chrome, what, look at what this Chrome engineer said, Chris Bloom. Yeah. This is from some Microsoft, time ago though, right? Um, 17 hours ago. Oh no. Okay. Microsoft denies Chrome the tools it needs to protect users when installed from the Windows Store. By the, by the way, they grant those tools to Edge. So we made a mini app to help users get the full safe version of Chrome, but it was pulled. Wow. Well, I, we can add that to my list of how this thing unfurled because that's a crazy new chapter Yeah. in something that is... Bizarre. Already, I mean, this is already <laughs> nuts. This story is nuts. I know. Yeah. Crazy. It is. really is. I know. Yeah. All right. You ready for our celebrity impersonator? <laughs> Marilyn Monroe is going to join. No, Chris Capicella is going to be joining us in just a few Happy minutes. Before we... birthday. <laughs> best of <laughs> present. We had, remember that at our, one of our New Year's Eve mm -hmm. marathons. We had yes. a uh, a woman impersonating Marilyn Monroe, yeah. 
And I was, yeah, Alex did a great job at that, by the way. Uh, yeah, he's really good. <laughs> I was so embarrassed because she sat in my lap and she was, you know, there was quite a bit of uh, activity. And it was actually very <laughs> suspicious when she turned up murdered <laughs> lately. Yeah. Later, and, uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and she left that big red. But my wife's mm -hmm. standing right there. Sure. And it was, is she, was she put, she set it up. I just, it's like, it was, it was very uncomfortable for me to, to have. Uh, this is some insight into your relationship. It, it makes me wonder <laughs> <laughs> a number of things. Uh, she said, next year, Yogi Bear. Yogi All right. Bear. Yeah, I don't know why I said that. Oh, All right. Like let's, Yogi Berra? Yogi Berra. That would be great. The former catcher. Uh, no, wait. He wasn't related. He didn't. That wasn't. No, she went out with somebody Joe else. DiMaggio. Joe DiMaggio. Joe DiMaggio. Yeah, I wasn't really linking those two, but you make a good point there, Paul. Let's take, dyslexia helps. <laughs> let's take a little break. We're going to get things uh, set up. We'll call. We'll get to Cat, Chris Cap on the line, and he will join us. Microsoft's chief marketing officer in just a moment. But first, a word from our sponsor. Go to webinar. I bet you. I bet you. Chris Cap knows about go to webinar. It is. Listen to how many people use go to webinar this year, 2017. As we come to an end, they've got the count: 55,000 customers. 2.7 million interactive web events. Wow. 60 million views in one year. Go to webinar. I've done it. It's great. It's a great way to give a presentation. I think I gave a presentation on protecting your teens online. Among, I think I've done several, actually. Go to webinar is one of the best ways to interact with your prospects and your customers, to train, to explain. It's just even for things like uh, all hands meetings. With GoToWebinar, you can create a custom email invitation, confirmations, and reminders. That's important as you get closer to the date. You want to remind people, hey, don't forget. And with GoToWebinar, you can even handle it with automated email templates. So you just set it up once and it, you're good to go. And of course, the invitations, everything, all the webinar material has your company logo, your custom image. Create and schedule pre-recorded webinars that are as interactive as live events. And one of the great interactivity features is these polls. You can do as many as 20 polls in, uh, in each webinar with each poll having 20 questions. Obviously, you don't have to use all 20, but you can. You can do them ahead of time. I would, in fact, when you do a webinar, this worked really well for us. To You, know, you might have a poll at the beginning finding out who your audience is, you know, which, by the way, helps you generate... Uh, qualified leads if you're doing a sales presentation. Um, but you can also do uh, polls on the fly, even just yes, no questions, quick little things just to, well, well, they serve two purposes. One, to let you know, how, you know, stuff as you go, how you're going over and so forth. But two, keeping the audience engaged. And those polls work not just when you're live, but even in the downloads, the, the on-demand version. So the audience really is interacting with you the whole time. It's really great. End-to-end, 128-bit AES encryption. Number one in customer satisfaction, you can have up to six presenters, each sharing their camera or a screen or an app, and, you know, virtually unlimited attendees. Go to webinar. Turn your next presentation into a conversation with GoToWebinar. For more information, visit GoToWebinar.com slash podcast. That's GoToWebinar.com slash podcast. And we thank GoToWebinar for their support. It's Chris Capicella time. End of the year, Chris Capicella time. <laughs> it's another Windows Weekly sandwich with Chris Capicella in the middle. I am so, this is, exactly, this is so exciting. Welcome, Chris. Hey, thank you so much. It's good to be back. Let's just really quickly see, are you back in the attic or are you in a new... I I you am are? back in the attic. Oh, okay. <laughs> same I ask, have you, same have location. Have you remodeled? It looks a little different this year. Does it? Uh, I don't know. I It feels pretty much the same. I don't have the big Surface Studio box. I went with the Xbox One, one yeah, Xbox yep. over one shoulder, and uh, a recent tweet that I that I tweeted over the other shoulder just for just for today, just for you guys. Ah, thank you, Chris. Yes. I uh, I have you and I share many boxes apparently. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. We might all share many boxes. <laughs> yep. <laughs> no surprise, no surprise there. I did unplug the other phone, so when Frank starts calling, we shouldn't hear it this year. Excellent. As we did last year. <laughs> I, I have to say, I mean, based on what I've seen Frank tweeting and Instagramming, I don't think you're going to hear from him this week. It seems like he's, uh, you know, out and about. I hope so. He needs a little break. <laughs> 
So how are you guys doing? All right, thanks for coming. See you next year. Great. Right? I know. Yeah. <laughs> thanks. Thanks There's for coming. There's always this awkward moment where the, where, yeah. where it's it's my fault. Paul and Mary Jo wonder is Leo going to say anything, or should we take over here? So let me it's, tell you, uh, I will. I it's you know, all yours. it's hard not being in the same room, yeah. and it's yeah, a little it easier. Otherwise, when you have I'd be video, doing hand which, signals. You know, yeah. 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 <laughs> I think that means you guys get. To yeah, know. it's your turn. <laughs> your turn, kids. I thought you did a nice job last week with the uh, sort of the recap, the the top news stories, and I think Mary Jo did sort of the under, the underappreciated mm -hmm. yeah. or maybe underreported yeah. stories, which I thought was kind of cool. Yeah. Yep. Thanks. Yeah. So that was the first thing we wanted to ask you for your recap. Right. Your, yeah. You know, best moments, places mm -hmm. you think Microsoft did well, where it could it improve, perhaps in the new year. Yeah. Give us a little um, recap. <clears throat> Gosh, you guys did a, a super good job. I, I think a few things that uh, jump out for me. One is obviously just uh, when you're competing with the top five market cap companies on the planet right now are uh, Apple, Google, Microsoft, Amazon, and Facebook. And when you're competing with that set of people, um, you know, having a great financial year is, is obviously a very important thing. So uh, I start with kind of the, the numbers that we care a lot about when it comes to showing growth and certainly the commercial cloud revenue was a big big important number for us so uh, the fact that we exceeded this target that we had talked about uh, earlier than we said we would exceed it I think is a really really great thing you know we exceeded 20 billion dollars of commercial cloud annualized revenue and that for us is a it's just a major major milestone uh, we also loved seeing the Azure growth and the Dynamics 365 growth which were 90% and about 70 percent uh, last quarter. That is awesome for us to see. Um, you guys don't often get a chance to talk about LinkedIn, but you know, for us, that's a major, major bet. And Jeff Weiner and the team have just done a fantastic job. Uh, they've got over 530 million uh, members, which is a important big number. And then Office on on the commercial side continues to do really well. We're at about 120 million uh, monthly actives. But on the consumer side, which a lot of people don't pay that much attention to, you know, we're over 28 million people who are using that subscription on a regular basis those are paid you know paid users uh, and that's that's pretty phenomenal we're very very happy happy with that too so I think you know if I just do the pure financials there's a lot of things to be pleased with uh, on perhaps more of the niche area uh, Minecraft continues to do super well for us and we're seeing a lot of uptake in education with Minecraft which is super important to us because of uh, the big focus that we have there you guys talked a little bit about us stealing a little bit of share in this recent report. It was a small number, but we'll we'll obviously take it. But more importantly to us is seeing new experiences that we think are really unique to Microsoft and Minecraft and EDU uh, would certainly would certainly be one of those. And then you know with the Windows business, which you guys cover in incredible detail, for us. Uh, introducing new experiences and figuring out ways to modernize this massive install base is really important. So you've talked pretty eloquently about mixed reality and how we've tried to make uh, those headsets with our partners uh, much more approachable for people. And I think that was an important one that I think Paul called out in one of one of his things. And then just recently, of course, we announced the Always Connected PC with Qualcomm and a couple of our big OEM partners. So when it comes to Windows, one of the things we look for is, are we introducing important new capabilities? And then do we have the actual infrastructure in place to keep people up to date uh, and you know having two major updates uh, happening this past year relatively smoothly uh, I think is a is a great thing for us having 600 million plus people on a on a Windows 10 version is super super critical to us and that those would be some things that I would I would kind of uh, call out that are important from a Windows perspective pushing the envelope a little bit on what's expected and what's capable and then being able to roll that out to you know many hundreds of millions of people because if we do that well then I think developer interest will will certainly follow um, and then the last one for me I'd call out is just gaming uh, near and dear to, to my heart and the entire Phil Spencer and the entire Xbox team 
you know, for me, uh, there's a lot of attention we're paying to Xbox One X and Xbox One S, the two consoles <laughs> that are hard to say together. Um, mm -hmm. But the thing that I think we are really excited about is the fact that, you know, we're starting to see a lot of gaming happening with Play Anywhere games on Windows 10 PCs as well as Xboxes. We do want to move to this world where we're more gamer centric. We love the console. We love PCs. But we want you to be able to play anywhere. And so the introduction of of Xbox uh, Game Pass uh, far exceeded what we expected to happen in terms of how many people have signed up to pay for that service and use that service. We were relatively modest in our expectations and you know we were off by an order of magnitude and we're lucky that it's a digital product so people can buy as many. We don't run out of it <laughs> uh, like we mm -hmm. do consoles or controllers. But I think for me, 2017 is the year that the Xbox business uh, has really fundamentally um, shifted uh, to be very, very focused on the user, a little bit like Office did when we moved from the old Office to Office 365 and having my games pick up on the second console or the PC right where I left off, those types of things. Uh, and then having a, you know, a gaming subscription that's a little bit like a Netflix approach, uh, I think sets us up for a pretty different future, which we're, which we're excited about. So those would be some of the highlights. Um, I can pause there if you want, or I can, I can also talk about some of the, some of the lowlights now and then open it up if you like. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, give us the lowlights. Why not? <laughs> yeah, okay. yeah. Okay. You know, so that you, there's plenty. There's always plenty to learn. Uh, sort of every single year, uh, it's always interesting to see what people talk about on Twitter or what people send me messages on. And I'll put aside all of the "Hey, I don't like this name" or "I don't like this commercial" or you know, "Why didn't you market this more?" or "Why didn't you guys do a better job on this product?" You know, for me, uh, one of the more interesting learnings that we had this year was uh, the work that we're doing to bring Windows and Office. Uh, to be more aligned, uh, and that's aligned on release cadence, that's aligned on support policy, obviously getting Office into the store, all of these things that uh, probably from an outsider's perspective may sound incredibly obvious. Uh, and you know, you'd say, of course, Windows and Office should be very, very aligned to all of these things. But given our history, we haven't done it that way. And Satya and Terry Meyerson and Rajesh Jha have really pushed very, very hard to get us on a path. But it hasn't been without its bumps. And I'd say we, we want to make more progress in making Windows and Office just feel incredibly simple uh, to work with and get started and not have separate you know, kind of separate everything's from an infrastructure perspective. And that's been that's been a big learning for us. And then the other one that's, you know, really doesn't matter at all from a business results perspective, uh, but matters a lot from the people who really love the company, uh, particularly a lot of people who are Windows fans, was the Groove Music uh, exit. And, you know, if you would just look at how does that business run and what are the costs to being in that business where you have to pay tremendous licensing fees and you hope to sell lots of subscriptions and you look at someone like Spotify at 50 million subscriptions and you look at someone like Groove Music at a very, very small number. From a business case perspective, uh, from a stock perspective, all of those things, incredibly obvious to do what we did, uh, which was to exit that Music Pass uh, business. But the pain that that causes for the diehard fans who've been with the music service through all its different names and all its different instantiations over the past I don't know 15 years you know that that's a it's a great it's a great reminder that what make what may make sense from a business perspective uh, causes a lot of pain to some of your most diehard fans. And, you know, I don't know that there's a perfect way to avoid that pain, but it was another, I think, good lesson for us to to sort of see and, and feel because it is very, it gets very emotional for people. And, you know, we're very, we try to be very attuned to that. And so that would be one that when I think back on 2017, that one sticks out in my mind as, as the right thing to do for the company, but not the, you know, not a happy thing to do for some of our very diehard fans. Silence. And I think that uh, silence, ties Paul. to a conversation just about consumer in general, right? And Mary yeah. Jo and I had discussed this earlier today between ourselves. And I think, you know, we could come up with ideas about, you know, where you might fall or where Microsoft might fall in the consumer market. But what do you, you know, what do you say to the people who are worried about that kind of stuff? You know, not just the fans of Groove, but uh, you know, the fans of Microsoft Band, which was canceled last year, or uh, fans of Cortana who maybe don't like the the progress we've seen so far this year. I mean, is Microsoft serious about the consumer space? How, how do you kind of address that? 
Yeah, I mean, I certainly I love the opportunity to address it because uh, we absolutely feel like the consumer is completely critical to the future of the company. We know that if you lose consumers, it's just a matter of time before you lose uh, uh, workers and then you eventually lose the enterprise. So uh, for us, we don't see like a consumer side of the company and a commercial side of the company. You have to have strength with students. You have to have strength in our view with gamers. You have to have strength with creators. Uh, and so for us, the three consumer segments that we're most focused on are, are those Three, gamers, students, uh, and creators. Now, that means we're not going to be in every single business uh, that you could be as a consumer tech company. We have to pick areas where we feel like our position of strength gives us permission to bring new things out to consumers who will be uh, see that they're you know, adjacent positions that are interesting and they won't say, God, why would Microsoft ever do something like that? Um, so, you know, I, I don't think you'll see us creating new uh, TV shows like you see Amazon and Netflix <laughs> doing. Yeah. But, you yeah. know, quickly people go there and they say, gosh, if you're not going to do that or you're not going to compete with Facebook, you don't have a social network, I guess you don't care about consumers. And to that, we would say that's absolutely not true. We, we aren't going to compete in certain spaces, but Boy, we love gaming. We love trying to make students really successful uh, in school. And Minecraft is a perfect example of bridging the gaming world with the, with the student world as teachers are finding really engaging ways to use Minecraft in the classroom. And Google and Apple, our two biggest competitors in the education space, really don't have anything like it. And so um, we care a lot about them. You look at what we're doing at the Surface line and what we're doing with Office, embedding AI into it. And that's very geared towards people who love to build things and create things. And so we will have our areas of focus, but you know, I spend far more money marketing our consumer products than I spend marketing our commercial products. Uh, you have to be on TV with consumer products. You have to spend a lot on online video. If you're going to be in the gaming space, you, you've got to be there. If you're going to have a piece of hardware like the Surface Laptop and Surface Pro, you've got to show it on TV. Uh, we've got to show our OEM partners uh, you know, in, in advertising as well. So you know, if you just look at the spend of, of what we do, it's easy to say, okay, they care about consumer. But we also want to be, frankly, relatively bold. And I want to have the permission to try something. And if it fails, I want to have the permission to stop. And that's very hard for people. <laughs> yep. Um, but it, it is the reality of what most of these companies do. Um, there was this fantastic Jeff Bezos uh, analyst call, I don't know how many quarters ago, soon after the Fire phone um, failed. And one of the analysts was giving him an incredibly hard time about what a big deal they made about the phone and how it had failed and they just stopped. And they sort of said, you know, don't you feel terrible about that? And he essentially said the, you know, the moral equivalent of, of hold my beer. You know, he basically <laughs> said, that. like, if, if you That's think great. that was an epic failure, you know, you yeah. probably shouldn't be a fan of the company because you haven't seen anything yet. We're going to fail on such a huge scale uh, that'll okay. make that look so small because it's the only way we know how to shoot for big things and, and have big things. So I hate to get us into the situation where we would say, God, we have this great idea called the band. Let's bring it to the market. And then a year or two later, if it doesn't work, we feel like, oh my gosh, we, we have to stay in this because mm. we're not allowed to exit anything. So somehow, obviously we want to have big hits, but we have to be bold enough to know that when we don't have a big hit, it's okay for us to say, hey, that didn't work. Let's learn from it. Let's move on. But let's not still have a bunch of resources that could be working on something that could be a big success, still trying to keep something that's clearly not going to make it kind of alive. And I, I know our fans don't love to hear that, but I'd rather be bold and try stuff and have them fail and deal with the, oh, I hate that you guys stopped doing that, than um, just kind of nurture what we not have. Yeah. And, yeah, and you don't want to not push something. You don't want it to fail because you didn't give it enough juice. Do you think that's particularly yeah. a problem for technology companies? 
Boy, it's a, I certainly feel like it's a problem for hardware companies. Uh, on the software side, particularly for things like cloud services, I think you see people doing things very quickly, and when they don't work, they just kill them. And people seem to forgive a little bit more than something that actually plugs in. You know, we're finding that when we sell something that people spend hard money on, and I, there's something about a physical product, they're far, far less forgiving. Um, but I, I don't know how to translate that. You know, well, obviously I understand that you spend money on it and stops you know being supported you're kind of you kind of got a you got a constant reminder of your foolishness right exactly mm -hmm. that's yeah. exactly right it's right yeah. there on your wrist or yeah. it's right there you know in the drawer yeah, yeah. yeah. so those are some ask, of my highs and lows I wanna, uh, based on your on something you just said about gaming i have to ask a gaming question wow Me, I love it. she is a huge question. fan of wow. gaming by the way i am a huge fan i, I need some I tips well, too with, i know mary joe wants to ask about player unknowns battlegrounds so uh, <laughs> yeah go ahead, go ahead. pub pub g right. pub very nice pub g. very nice, nice. pub g look performance at you, tips look at me um no the i did want to ask about gaming though because we we talked about this on i think the last episode of windows weekly we were saying if you had asked us a year ago, was Microsoft going to stay in gaming? We were both kind of on the fence if you were. We, we were yeah. thinking maybe they're going to sell Xbox. You know, maybe they're going to spin it off, have a separate company or just decide, hey, we're more of an enterprise company. And, you know, it's it's cool. We were in gaming, but we're not going to make that a big bet. But this year, it felt like you doubled down on gaming. You're yeah. all in. It's You even just called gaming gamers one of the three consumer spots where you're placing big bets. What bet. changed? Yeah. What made? Well, I, what happened? <laughs> I think you know. For, for, certainly, internally, we've never felt like it was something we weren't committed to. The big yeah. change, symbolically, we did, of course, was to uh, Satya promoted Phil Spencer uh, to the senior leadership team, so he's now a direct report to Phil, and that sent a very positive and heavy signal that we are very committed to to the gaming business. For us, I think the realization that. Um, a, gaming is the number one um, uh, thing that people do on just about every device that we look at, whether it's a, a PC, whether it's a phone, a, a tablet, a console. So it just has this incredible share of computing time. It's clearly something that people have tremendous passion about. It's something we have great strength in. You could say people have tremendous passion about music as well, but between iTunes and Spotify and Pandora, what have you, it's not a position of strength for Microsoft. Um, so you have to align what do people want to do with computing and then where do we have a position of strength? And then finally, I would say we see an opportunity to do something that, frankly, our competitors don't really seem to care too much about, which is to put the gamer at the very center and have let them play the games they want with the people they want on the devices they want, which is sort of our little tagline. And it sounds a little bit trite, but um, you know, being able to buy a game from Microsoft Studios once and to be able to play it on your console and then to be able to play it on your PC, uh, that's really exciting. Being able to play Minecraft, you know, I watch my daughters play Minecraft and they're playing with their friends who are using an iPad and my daughters are on a Surface or another one's on the Xbox and bringing those together, we just think that's so uh, there's so much value there um, that that just makes a, a tremendous amount of sense for us to to kind of go after it with gusto. And then, of course, the combination of devices and cloud uh, is a is a really really wonderful thing for our store, uh, the Microsoft Store. One of the areas we have tremendous power is by being a great place for game publishers to bring their game because we can help them uh, have a more intimate relationship with their with their gamer through our platform than we think our competitors can do because we can bring together Windows and Xbox and, and do things with our cloud that they as developers, I think, will get very, very excited about. So we have important positions of strength in the classic places that tech companies want to have strength. We have strength in content. We have strength in the end user endpoint. We have strength in the platform, and we have strength in the commerce or the store. And how many businesses can you say that about uh, for Microsoft or, frankly, for anybody? And that, I think, is one of the reasons we really we really love the space. Does that make sense? It does. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, you, you had kind of addressed some of the gaming stuff earlier and, and touched on some of the stuff I feel that is a huge advantage for Microsoft, the cross-platform stuff, uh, you know, the ability to 
move the experience off of the particular device. You know, it's yeah. huge. But the the other thing uh, that we had talked about earlier in this show was some of this kind of weird cooperation stuff. You know, there was the the Google Chrome thing, which maybe is a little too soon to discuss in some ways in the store. Um, but also uh, the cooperation stuff with, let's say, a company like Amazon, where yeah. You've announced you're going to integrate with the Cortana and Alexa stuff, but that hasn't really happened yet. And like, I mean, how? Do, I, I mean, obviously, you guys are going to compete. You're going to cooperate, but it's. I mean, how does this stuff all Compose. come together? I mean, how do you? Yeah. yeah how do you know when to yeah. push back and when to, you know, give them a hug or whatever? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, you know, I would say it's. Uh, there's no perfect paint by numbers sort of approach. We basically try to look at where uh, do we think somebody has a, a wonderful asset that would benefit our customers? Where do we have value to add to the partner? And is there a way to bring things together? So Cortana's intimacy with your schedule, your schedule, your calendar, your office documents, the things that are uh, things that we have an incredible corpus of through, through what we do for our customers. How do you bring that to multiple devices and having the Cortana SDK is a big way to do that but also being able to have Alexa bridge to Cortana would be another way to do that Peggy Johnson is only maybe 4 years into the company I think about 3 and a half years into the company and you know she's taken over all of our biz dev and between Peggy and Satya and the rest of the SLT I think the senior leadership team we've really tried to take a fresh perspective to uh, partnerships compared to the Microsoft of old. And that means that sometimes I think we'll get them right and people will be like, oh, this makes perfect sense. I wish you had done this earlier. And sometimes <laughs> the people are going to like sort of scratch their head and say, gosh, I'm not quite sure what they were hoping would come out of this. I don't make heads or tails. I can't make heads or tails of that one. We'll, you know, just like we do with our products, just like we do with our marketing, I think we'll have some hits and we'll have some misses. But I think you can expect us to do more of it. Uh, to have someone of Peggy's caliber at the company with the people that she has deep connections with and the ability to uncover new opportunities for us to partner, I think is 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 quite exciting. Um, you know, Google, gosh, we'd love to see Chrome in the Windows Store or the Microsoft Store. We just want them to do it the same way they're doing it to get into the iOS Store. And as you mentioned, right. there there are ways to do that that we're going to let that happen, and we'd love we'd love to partner with them to to do it. But you know, it can't be a bootstrapper to just go outside the store and install something else. Uh, that's that's relatively that's relatively easy to understand. I think um, Amazon's super huge competitor of ours, and yet they're one of our biggest customers because they host lots of Exchange and lots of Windows Server and AWS, and they pay us for every one of them. And so these relationships <laughs> are com are complicated, nice. uh, and, and which is you know that's that's fine. We're happy to have that business. But, you know, part of the challenge of running a big company like this is just figuring out um, where do you try things? Where do you go huge? Adobe's become a massive partner for us on AWS, or on, Am on Azure, not on AWS. Uh, and, you know, we want, we want more of those. And we're going to be in the, you know, in the, in looking out for them. Okay. And, I want to ask. It's great, a, job, it's great job security for you guys to help the world dissect <laughs> these when we can't tell you exactly what we were thinking about every one sure. of them. We do our best. We try. You, you, do super well. you do super well. I want to ask a question about because I know you're very passionate about turning people into fans. Yeah. Um, and you've given a lot of talks about, you know, wanting to make people fans of Microsoft's technology. So we, of course, because this is Windows Weekly here, from a lot of people about the new Windows um, update strategy, Windows as a service. And, you know, some people are really excited about getting all the new features twice a year, and some people are not so excited about that. Uh, they exactly. they think it's too fast, right? And they, especially home users, they, they kind of feel like they're guinea pigs for some of this stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so my question is, how do you kind of uh, do both? How do you satisfy people who love getting things fast and want to get it even faster? And then the IT pros who are like, wow, this is too fast. We can't keep up. And it's getting to be a huge headache for us to try to manage the way Windows as a service is working. Yeah, it's it's you're spot on about the challenges there. The you know the one thing I would say is we feel like this is an opportunity for Microsoft to do um, uh, something that 
uh, Google and Apple just don't even try to do, which is to essentially say, hey, we're going to give you a way to keep your users super up to date. You're not going to have to have IT staff that are you know, doing all these crazy desktop management uh, activities. We want you to be able to put those people on other things that, that are important to you. And we want you to be able to take an image of Windows that we can know is safe and secure and sort of lock it down and use it in really mission critical scenarios like running a robotics arm on the you know automotive manufacturing shop floor. You don't want that getting updates. You just want it to be hardened. And we'll support that, you know, and we won't try to update that. We want customers to be able to choose between those two different worlds. And we want them to be able to segment their PCs and say, these are the ones that I want sort of in a hardened state. And these are the ones that I want to be kept more up to date. We're trying to find the right balance of what does being kept up to date look like? Is it twice a year? Is it four times a year? Do we let you delay and pick your date? Uh, how many times do we let you delay? Because the more you delay, the less secure that machine becomes, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And I would say we, you know, I think we're in a much, much better place than we were when we shipped Windows 10. And we see that with the number of deployments in the enterprise that customers are really uh, moving towards it. But I would say that customers realize that this is something that we can do for them that they can't get from Apple or Google. And they do, you know, it is fascinating to us to see them tell us how hard this is and then to have them, you know, take out an iPad that they're using for work. And it's like, oh, well, interesting. How, how are you managing that one? And the answer is, of course, they're not. It's just whatever Apple does to the machine, they do to the machine. And so we can set a higher bar for Microsoft and win the loyalty and trust of people who really do care about uh, this stuff tremendously. But we don't want to go back to a world where we have people on, you know, really, really old versions of our stuff that we can't update it for their security. We can't give them a, a better experience. So we're trying to find the right balance. I think we're way better off than we were when he shipped to Windows 10. We'll keep listening. We'll keep learning. Uh, and, you know, you guys, will you'll keep telling us what you're hearing and, and how we're doing there. It's funny that people complain about it when it comes to their mobile phone, but they just deal with it. And I think we can do better than that, but we still can learn some of the lessons about uh, sort of the mobile world, which is a far more, far more current and up-to-date OS on most, certainly most iPhones and, and even Android phones. So that's kind of how I think about it. It's not a yeah. definitive, you know, it's yeah. not a, it, we're trying to find the right balance. I do think the bar for us is much, much higher. And by reaching it, we earn customers, you know, as, as fans, and that helps us with our competition. Absolutely. You know, one of the big advantages that Microsoft has is its retail stores, depending on where you live, I suppose. Yeah. Um, but with Microsoft not really having its own phone platform anymore, you've been selling third-party phones, mostly Samsung devices, it looks like. I mean, do you have plans to expand that? I mean, how do you choose which phones are in the store? Do you have any, uh, I mean, maybe this is something you couldn't even acknowledge, but I mean, uh, plans to get the Microsoft launcher pre-installed? on devices from OEMs and so forth, you know, create kind of a, a pseudo Microsoft phone that was running on Android. Yeah, so David Porter, who runs the the stores team in, in, in my world, <clears throat> came up with the idea of just saying, hey, look, what if we could find an OEM partner, uh, be it whoever, Samsung, Google, mm -hmm. whoever makes an Android phone, Apple for an iPhone, who would be willing to have us do things so that when you take that phone out of the box, it has a wonderful Microsoft experience on top of uh, Android or iOS or whatever. Uh, you know, that we think would be valuable given uh, that we're not selling our Windows phones in the stores. Can we still show people what it's like to essentially have a, an Android shell that has all of the Microsoft experiences from Cortana to OneNote to Outlook to Minecraft on the phone to the launcher, which you mentioned? Sure. And we really just went from one OEM to the other and started talking to them about the idea. Samsung was the one who was sort of most eager to have the S8 uh, in, in the stores, and they liked right. the U.S.-based mm -hmm. footprint that we have with those physical stores. And so we were able to do that. But we are not um, – we're, we're re relatively partner agnostic on this. It really comes down to 
uh, how willing is a partner to allow us to do the things to the phone so that out of the box it has right. a real Microsoft experience. And that's always a rub with someone who may not want you to take their assistant off and put your assistant on. But we we love that notion of you being able to walk into the store and buy a, a beautiful phone that has a great Microsoft experience on it, even if it's not a Windows phone. And uh, there's no magic to it. It's literally just talking to these partners and seeing their level of interest and their flexibility, frankly. Right, right. Yeah, it I, definitely caught some of our listeners and our readers by surprise when Android yeah. phones started showing up in the Microsoft Store. Well, yeah. and on, on I mean, the flip side, I mean, I, I'm in the same way that Microsoft has an interest in doing what you just described, as you must know, your fans also have an interest in this happening. <laughs> you know, yeah, we hear that right, all right. the time from people. Yep. Yeah, I definitely. think you know the one thing I like to re re remind people is like of the top four of the top five market cap companies on the planet. Uh, uh, Apple, Google, Microsoft, Amazon, and Facebook. Really, only Apple is the only of those five that uh, has very much kind of their own world soup to nuts. The other four very large, they all happen to be tech companies. They all have really embraced this notion that you're going to create experiences that you're going to want on other people's platforms. And, you know, that this Android phone in the stores is nothing more than another example of that. You know, Amazon's very happy to have Alexa and Kindle on every device they can possibly get it on, even if it's not their Fire tablet. Because, you know, those four companies just really understand that in a cloud-based world, endpoints are interesting, but, you know, being on only one endpoint is kind of crazy. And so when you think about the strategy of four out of the five top companies, there's an incredible similarity on wanting distribution and wanting uh, to be able to showcase your stuff on all popular endpoints, no matter if they come from your ecosystem or somebody else's. Well, Apple's really the only the only one that's outside of those five. Yeah. They also okay. happen to be number one, uh, which is, you know, kudos to them for <laughs> sure. the iPhone. <laughs> yeah. But it's interesting yeah. that none of the other five can have, you know, can replicate it. Uh, and I don't think any of the other 50 could replicate it. It's really quite unique. Mm. Yeah, I agree. I have a, I have a kind of open-ended question for you. Um, okay. If, and, and I'm not asking you to like pick your favorite child. I'm not saying what's your favorite sure. product at Microsoft. This is not that question. It's, it's more like, what do you think is... But what is your favorite product? What is your product? <laughs> no, but what what is a product or a service at Microsoft that you think is kind of like a little bit under the radar, a little yeah. underappreciated that you're, you're like, guys, you should watch this because this is yeah. going to be big. Yeah, I kind of, I, I'm happy to give you a handful of them. First of all, my favorite product uh it, just to answer that great question, from a hardware perspective, there's no doubt the Surface Laptop uh, is is my favorite. Um, is the battery life, the balance of of weight and size and the beauty of the device. I love the colors. Uh, I actually am running Windows 10 S on one. I get the benefit of running lots of machines, so it's it's relatively easy for me to run run Windows 10 S. I I love seeing what that experience is like, uh, etc. So if I if I picked one, that that would certainly be it. Um, the on the hardware side, on the software side, it's much, much harder. Uh, I would say Excel is certainly really, really high at the top of my list. OneNote would be very, very high at the top of my list too, um, just because of what those products do for me in my job. They're just so hard for me to imagine replacing with something, with something else. So I'll, I'll put those two uh, way up there too. In terms of sleeper products, uh, th that's a great one. I mentioned Teams last year, and I think you guys were like, "What Teams? What the heck is he talking about?" <laughs> Um, but I still, I still would keep it on on my list. Um, the and I can't share any numbers yet. Uh, we're waiting for the right time to share some numbers. We've been um, unbelievably pleased at how many people have picked up Teams and are doing uh, important, important work in it. And I think it's one of those products that when someone demos it to you, it's like, okay, fine. When someone explains it to you, you're like, you know, fine. Once you actually start using it, uh, it's funny how many things turn and, you know, your standalone one note things just become part of the notebook. That's part of the team and your SharePoint site just becomes part of the thing. That's part of the team and all your documents just become part of the team space. And so, uh, that's one where I'd say, I bet FI18 or 20, 
2018 will be a very, very big year uh, for teams because we built that product incredibly quickly. We're iterating on it pretty fast, and the adoption is very fast. Uh, and we haven't even introduced a super viral motion yet. And so that would be one that I think you may not um, think of as much as we do. And if you you know were a fly on the wall inside the senior leadership team, uh, that would be one that you you might be surprised to hear um, to hear the the energy behind. Another one I'm going to throw out there that you're just gonna you're gonna be like I oh, don't have no idea what he's talking about is. <laughs> Um, is Microsoft is Microsoft Stream, which is part oh. of Office 365, and it's essentially oh. the simple way to think about it is just kind of YouTube for inside your company, where you have control over everything, and it, you know things aren't shared outside your company unless you want them to be. But it's basically a really really kicking video service. And things that I love about it are things like you take a video and you upload it to Microsoft Stream and we will automatically caption it for you. You know, you don't have to send it out to a production studio. We'll literally just listen to the audio and we'll automatically caption it for you, which means we can automatically translate it into many, many languages. So when you're watching a video play back, if you want to watch it in French, you just change it. Even though the person who produced the video just produced it in one language without any captions, we'll automatically do that. Searching into the video, you know, you can search for someone's name and we'll take you right, we'll show you all the videos that have that person's name mentioned and we'll take you right to the part of the video where that person's name was mentioned. So some really, really killer uh, sort of video, video as its own content type uh, um, capabilities that we think, you know, obviously we see video in marketing every day. It's all over the planet. Most enterprises, most companies haven't really harnessed the video assets they have internally. And so I actually think Microsoft Stream is a little bit of a, a little bit of a hidden gem uh, that you could Take a look at if you if you like. I I think it's a it's an awesome small thing, uh, and then finally the learning tools that we've shipped inside of Word uh, and OneNote that started as just a hackathon project during one week, which is our summer kind of uh, the world's largest private hackathon. Uh, they were born out of a small team that just wanted to create a way for kids with dyslexia and dysgraphia to be able to read more easily when using their computer screens, and it got so much energy inside the company that we've now shipped them inside of Word and um, and OneNote, and it's another area where we see teachers kind of going crazy for our tools versus versus Google. I still don't think the world knows about the learning tools uh, in the way that they that they could. So those would be a few that I mentioned. Teams, Microsoft Stream, and the learning tools, which are part of Word and OneNote. Stream is a surprising one. I, I have Good. to say, I'm, I'm so I was glad. So glad surprised. I brought a surprise. <laughs> but you know what? I, it makes me wonder, because I know you guys are thinking a lot about co like conferencing in the future and what is a conference room supposed to look like in the future and how can you make it smarter using AI and other technologies. Does exactly. the stream fit in there too? For sure. Somehow? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, if you watch if you watch the disaster that is most modern meetings, you know, how long does it take the meeting started? <laughs> How do you figure out what happened in the meeting afterwards? When some, you know, when Paul is presenting, but Mary Jo wants to present something on her screen, how long does that take? Someone wants to show a video. Oh, there's no audio. Why can't we get the audio to work? Like all these really simple things. We would love these scenarios where you know we're sitting in a room together and someone can just say, you know, hey Cortana, you know, show me Excel sales last month and. Boom. Hey, Cortana, show me the new holiday ad that, you know, Apple just launched and up comes the ad. Like those scenarios are very important in video. You know, video is really yeah. key. It we also like just you guys are poised to do that, actually. I yeah. mean, that's Microsoft Graft, essentially, and just applied to voice, really. And applied to a very particular scenario. It's a specific presentation type, yeah. Exactly, exactly. And so that's one where I think we're one of the few companies that really cares about that scenario, particularly with those big five, you know, we're really the only one. And uh, I think that's a that video becomes really important uh, for those types of things. So I think we have one more question. Is that Go for it. Right? Yeah, I'm taking up um, all your time. This is not no. uh, unique to Microsoft. You know what, Chris? We, we sit here all day just waiting to talk to you. This is not yeah, that's we true. Do. We sit here all year waiting <laughs> to talk to you. Yeah, yeah, exactly. For sure. Um, yeah. uh, we see, I see this in, with Google and Apple as well. But, um, you know, given your worldwide scoop, uh, scope at Microsoft, I mean, one of the complaints we get a lot is that it seems like a lot of products and services are U.S. centric or North American centric, or maybe North American little parts of Western Europe or yeah. whatever. I mean, how, how or how or when or what's the process for getting 
every, you know, Cortana is a great example. Like how do we get that everywhere? I mean, how do you do guys, yeah. how do you make that happen? What's going on with that kind of thing? Yeah, it's a great, it's a great area. And I would say that, you know, for something, it depends on the technology itself. Many of our products are in, you know, over a hundred languages, 140 countries, and we have great, great geographic distribution with high quality. Other products like, uh, say, hardware are much, much harder. You have to get the hardware certified in every country. Uh, and so there it comes down to, you know, that incremental country, you really have to believe that you're going to be able to sell enough units to make that uh, worth expanding to a country where office, people just take it for granted or windows, they just take it for granted. And until some of these businesses get to be of that large scale, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a little bit of a chicken and an egg problem. But for our hardware categories, it really is you have to take it country by country and make a business case and then, you know, make make it come true because it's super pain painful to enter a country and then exit a country because you're not doing you're not doing what you thought you would do. Cortana is probably the trickiest of all uh, because as most people know, uh, certainly fans of the show, Cortana is really powered by Bing. And so Bing and its geographic distribution is very related to Cortana in its geographic distribution. The last thing we want to do is bring Cortana to a country where a search is going to prove to be mediocre. And, you know, when right. you ask right. it to find something, we do some bad, you know, search or have to do some third party search. And I would rather right. not be in a country than be in a country with a mediocre or shall I say piss poor experience. <laughs> because then, you know, right. it's just, it's so frustrating for everybody. Um, Cortana is probably the hardest one for us because we have to get a bang to be everywhere, uh, and yep. it's not it's not today. It's got a few countries of real strength, uh, and so we have to expand that. And then, of course, the language, the speech recognition, has to get really, yep. really quite high. Uh, and it's one thing to do a Skype translate call, which you know, if you get ninety percent right, it's kind of like, oh my god, this is incredible. But if one out of 10 words you say to Cortana is really wrong, it's very, you know, the experience becomes very frustrating. We hear the feedback so loud and clear. Paul, you asked it, you asked it super diplomatically. Like you guys are such, well, you're always so polite to me. It's unbelievable. Well, but you know, we, it's not you personally doing this. Well, like, but. No, but it, it, you know, I represent, I represent the company. Yeah. So uh, I take it. The, I want to make sure the listeners know we are not idiots. Like we hear this feedback loud and clear. And if there was just some easy way for us to say, hey, let's move $50 million to this and that'll fix it. Of course we would have done that. There are some, you know, deeper uh, tech problems or challenges that we have to make it happen. But I, I, I want to make sure people know it, it does, when they say these things, we, we are listening and uh, we certainly wish we could move faster in some of the spaces that people have really been frustrated by um, because that's, you know, that's, uh, they want to use our products and how nice yeah. is that? And we want to satisfy that need. I would think everybody would understand sure. that. I mean, yeah, but it's well, frustrating. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you would think, Leo, <laughs> but uh, think. let me show you some I mean, of my emails. Obviously, Microsoft <laughs> wants to be in every country in the world yeah. with every single product. Yeah. I mean, why wouldn't yes. they? It's yeah, just, and it's, it's not easy. It's really, can we make the business work? Yeah. Essential. Yeah, yeah. I think that's that's doesn't surprise me. I okay, have one before, one last oh, question. Is yeah, it going to be a three day three D holiday uh, for Microsoft? Ah, that, oh, that's so nice. <laughs> Leo, by the way, if you're not familiar, is the master of the segue. Yeah, I saw that. I saw that. You might have In seen. You might have seen uh, seen this ad on your uh, TV set uh, once in a while somewhere. Yes, around there. I hope so. <laughs> Is that you, Chris? I, I really you thought know, that was you. A lot of people have said she looks a lot like me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's, it's a woman? Never mind. It's a young girl going off into space since you came along. where there are 3D monsters in the moon and gorilla with an extra eye in the, the trees, spaceship and a donut. Are the ocean this is really cute. When you're with I me. say, yeah. This, the music and makes I it. Yeah, I'm probably violating copyright law at this point. No, no, no. Let's, you paid for oh, the you license. May have. Yeah. You may have. That's what I'm saying, yeah. I know you didn't. <laughs> I'm I'm gonna ride on your copyright. <laughs> yes. It's really This cool. is a sweet one. It's yeah. sweet. Are these uh, 3D models all from uh, 3D paint and things or exactly. So and there's the actual actress uh, that we modeled. Oh that's the, neat. For, yeah. Oh, that was that's her. The people, yeah, that's the one people say looks all like me. Um, <laughs> that's so that was pure. That was pure. Is that uh, your daughter, Chris? <laughs> no, it's not. Um, 
Yes, all those characters were built in Paint 3D, which wow, is kind of fun, neat, and yeah. then animated yeah. through a third-party animation tool uh, that obviously runs on Windows. Uh, so we had a lot of fun with that one. It was a little less um, – uh, there was no sort of political undertones or nothing really sure. risky into this this year's holiday spot, and we felt like it was a, a sweet way to celebrate 3D, which we've done a lot in our advertising because we think it's kind of interesting and makes people think a little bit differently and matches the creator the creator vibe. So yeah. thank you for showing that. We've had, yeah. we've had a lot of fun with that, and the feedback's been been great. And the website, thankfully, has held up to the massive traffic that that's driven. <laughs> do you buy Do you buy TV with that and th- yeah. clip it up and chop it up and stuff? Because you're not, obviously exactly. not going to run a ninety second. It's it's pretty modest. You know, that's a six, we have a thirty. Oh, it's a second sixty. Well. Oh, okay. It's yeah. not a massive advertising spend, um, but it's it's you know it's on NFL. It's on you know for five or six days right in this window of time, and uh, we just think it's a nice way to to sort of. Uh, Embrace the holiday spirit as opposed to shamelessly promoting the surface or shamelessly. <laughs> yeah, no, and, but you, I remember you've well, done I, that last few years, and I think yeah, it's shameless really great, yeah. promotion in yeah. an ad is not shameless. It's just an <laughs> no, ad. it's just an ad. <laughs> Kathleen Hall and and the advertising team uh, does that does that every year. Hey, before you before you kick me off, uh, just a couple closing closing thoughts. One is, you mm-hmm. know, again, uh, one of the reasons I love coming on the show is just because I really love listening to the show, and I I'm constantly impressed by how much volume you guys somehow manage to process and work through and pull out the interesting tidbits. Uh, and I wanted to thank the three of you for sort of doing the show and Mary Jo and Paul oh, This in is not usually how these shows work, by the way. We're supposed to thank you, but yeah. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> like it's, it's, uh, thank you, it's impressive. I, I, it's, there aren't that many people that can sort of 95% of the time really, I think, provide insight to, to kind of what we're doing. And I'm often just like, man, they really, they got that one right. And that happens. Now I need to hear about the other 5%, but maybe I know, we can do exactly. that offline. They're the best. They're the best. That's okay. That's they okay. really that are. Ignites. I agree, Chris. <laughs> and I just, on my behalf, want to apologize for using Windows as a disservice as a title on a previous show. It's a good play of words. <laughs> and, then, and then the last thing is just, you know, Mary Jo, I just wanted a, a quick personal thank you for, uh, I posted on Facebook uh, when my mom passed away in November, and you just did a very simple sort of like of that post. Uh, and, you know, there's always some separation, obviously, between... Yeah. Uh, Microsoft and the journalists who cover us, but uh, for some reason I just found that very touching, and I wanted to say thank you for Aww. taking the time to just click <laughs> oh, that like nice. button. Oh, very sweet. human of yeah. you. So thank you. Yeah. You're one of us. You're a Massachusetts. Well, hum- and we're all humans. All Boston, right? Massachusetts. Yeah. Not a mass hole, but you are one of us. I didn't say mass hole. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously not. Exactly. Well, Chris, so anyways, I'll get you get to the rest of the show. But have thank a you for wonderful, having wonderful <laughs> holiday <laughs> and a uh, merry Thanks Christmas. Thanks for coming on again. Yeah. Thank you so much, everyone. Chris Capicella. Bye bye, Chris. CMO, uh, Microsoft Corporation. Let me uh, let me take him out of the uh, one. You know, <laughs> sandwich personalizes a gigantic corporation quite like a nice guy. <laughs> wow, <laughs> you, you know? know, you would think oh, uh, that everyone would understand that, but yeah, yeah. But people of, don't. He's a rare, <laughs> a rare, rare Avis. Um, doesn't mean he tries harder. That's another kind of Avis. Um, <laughs> we're going to take a break and then uh, back of the book. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. All right. We we'll continue with our last show, last Windows Weekly of the year in just a little bit. And we should mention that next week we have a best of episode. Some of the best moments, including the attack of Sriracha. <laughs> so there's actually some good stuff. I'm curious about the Jesus moment. I got to go look that one up. I know. Me too. <laughs> yeah, you, well, you have to watch. That's all. Best yeah. of. Yeah. Uh, that'll be our episode next weekend. We will be back then. Uh, what is that? January 4th, 2nd, 3rd, 4th, I think, uh, at uh, our usual time, 11 a.m. Pacific, 2 p.m. Eastern, um, 1900 UTC with Windows Weekly, the first Windows Weekly of 2018. Uh, And we'll be back, as always, with our great sponsor, Rocket Mortgage. Quicken Loans. Actually, the time is right. Buying a house is the biggest uh, investment you're going to make. In most cases, the largest check you'll ever write. And that's just the down payment. You know, it's a big deal. Uh, And and if you own a house, refinancing is a good thing to think about. Because especially now, this year, we know interest rates, they've already ticked up. The Fed ticked up one quarter of a point. I think they said they were going to do it three more times. In 2018, now would be an excellent time to lock in a great rate 
With Quicken Loans, the best lender in the country, number one in customer satisfaction for mortgage origination and mortgage servicing. That's J.D. Power says so. You know it's true. Number one for eight years running for mortgage origination. And I can guarantee it's going to be the same for 2018 because now they've got Rocket Mortgage. They decided that the traditional mortgage process, you know, going to a bank hat in hand, watching the guy use his special super-duper mortgage calculator, then going to the attic to find the pay stubs and the check statements we're calling. The, I usually, I don't have any print. So I got to call the bank and say, you know, can I get my 2013 check statements and all of that stuff? That's such a pain. And Rocket Mortgage completely eliminates that. You can do the entire thing on your phone or your computer or your tablet. You just go to rocketmortgage.com slash windows. In fact, you could go right now, even if you're not about to buy or you're thinking about buying or maybe you're thinking about refinancing. This is You don't have to go through the whole process. You can just go and get an, create an account and be ready. But if you go to an open house this week or maybe you go to the neighbors and they say, yeah, we were thinking about selling, and you say, wow, don't put it on the market. We want to buy. And you can then hold up your phone and say, and see, we're approved because it takes literally a minute. You don't have to go to the attic because they have trusted relationships with all the financial institutions so they can get anything they need. All you have to do is answer a few simple questions at rocketmortgage.com slash windows. They'll crunch the numbers. They can they pull those numbers instantly. And then based on your income, your assets, and your credit, they'll say, you qualify for this. What rate do you want? What term do you want? What down payment can you put down? And you can say go and bada bing, bada boom. It says on the screen, big green button. It's very nice. Very feels very good. Approved. Up. Show your show your realtor. Show the homeowner. And we're approved. We could buy that. And that puts you right at the front of the line, I have to tell you. Almost everybody else looks at the house and then walks away. Said, We'd like to make an offer and then we're going to get a loan. And blah, blah, blah. It could take a long, long time. Rocket Mortgage makes it easy. Apply simply. Understand every step of the way completely, fully, then mortgage confidently at rocketmortgage.com slash windows. Equal housing lender licensed in all 50 states and MLSconsumeraccess.org number 3030. Rocketmortgage.com slash windows. We thank them very much for their support. It's been a very good year. Let's go to the back of the book and kick things off with Paul Therott and a tip or two of the week. Yeah. So, uh, you know, it being the end of the year, I've been doing my top, you know, whatever of the year. I, top, I did today, I did my top 10 Microsoft stories of 2017, for example. Um, but I also have some uh, mobile app, uh, audiobook and podcast picks, so to speak. And I'm not going to go through the mobile app stuff. I mean, I, you know, for the most part, I don't use apps on a phone or um, a tablet or whatever, because I'm trying to have a unique entertainment experience per se. I mean, I use these things for work, email, calendars, that's, that stuff's all kind of obvious or whatever. But um, the podcast and the audiobook stuff is kind of interesting, though. I, I usually do um, audiobooks every year. This year, I, I brought it up to podcasts as well. And I won't go through the whole list. I don't have that many. But my uh, favorite podcast of the year uh, by a long shot was Two Keto Dudes, Carl Franklin and Richard Morris, um, talking about the ketogenic diet, uh, low-carb lifestyle, and so forth. Um, these guys, their mantra is show me the science. It's not you know, a hokey, uh, you know, low-fat Hype, whatever oat brand, you know, baloney kind of thing. It's the real deal. So, um, if you like me and you sit in front of a computer all day and don't move around a lot, and you're gaining weight, you might want to pay attention to this. Um, they have the answers, so that's worth listening to. On the audiobook front, uh, you know, I listen to audiobooks uh, each year. That uh, you know, some of which come out this year, some of which don't. Uh, fortunately, the two best ones, which I, I think are new to this year, but one is the new Dan Brown uh, no uh, novel, Origin. Uh, which is another one of those Robert Langdon books, which um, I really, really enjoyed listening to. It was a close call, but the other one I really liked, and this one's kind of going to be kind of a weird choice for some, is something called The Man from the Train. Um, this is <laughs> this is crazy. It's a nonfiction story. It's really well written, but more important, it's really well researched. This guy has is a baseball writer and a, a, like a statistician, and he basically oh, is that solved Bill one, James. Yes, he solved a 125 year old what? murder mystery. That is almost certainly the most prolific serial killer in the history of the United States, if not in the history of the world. What? And it is astonishing. And basically what had happened was there were these, there was a guy or guys murdering people with axes in various parts of the country. And he figured out that it was the same guy. What? And he, he maps out how it Statistically, happened. Statistically, right? He, uh... It is, it's crazy. <laughs> it is crazy. And if you think about 
you know, crime shows or, or just crime in general. I mean, obviously, if you go back to the turn of the century, ni- you know, 1900, um, you could have a crime that occurred in a town in the middle of Iowa or whatever, and then a no way crime that occurred yeah. in Maine, and no one would ever, no one talked to each other, no one had any way of knowing. There was no national newspaper or anything like that. And uh, it was only later in this guy's career that's, that someone and someone started figuring out, maybe it's the same person doing some of them, but he charted this stuff back over a period that is crazy. I, uh, I, I was like addicted to this book, and it is astonishingly good. Now, I, I know axe murdering is not for everybody, um, <laughs> but Lisa uh, would love this. She loves serial. For some reason, Lisa loves is, reading about serial killers. I don't know why. Awesome. It's awesome. Is he it's now? Awesome. Here's a Bill James in joke. He should call this one. Let's time this time. Let's eat the bones. Yes. <laughs> only only Paul um, really knows what I'm talking about when I say that. Yeah, it's that's he's, nice. He's awesome. Nice. Awesome. Nice. By the way, we yep. should. I guess we should disclaim that Audible is a sponsor, but uh, that isn't. Oh, okay. Well, yeah, big yeah, deal. You, that's nice. You, you're just I, talking I pay, about audio books. I, pay for Audible. I yeah, listen to Audible every yeah, single day. It has Audible. nothing to do with yeah, that. Nothing to do with that. Yeah, okay. Um, the other, and then for an app pick, I I had this app pick possibly twice in the past. Um, Oxenfree is a game that is available on Xbox. It's available on Windows. If you go to GOG.com, which is uh, GreatOldGames.com, it is available for free right now. This is an absolutely fun game. Uh, it's It would be a great thing to play on a tablet or whatever. Uh, it's a great thing to play on any platform. It doesn't really matter. Just grab a cut. If you don't have it, get it now. It's free. Um, great game. Downloading it. And thank you to Len. I don't know Len's last name. I apologize, but he linked me to this uh, via nice. email. And, and I should say great old games at GOG.com, whatever, is in the middle of a holiday sale like a lot of places are. So if you arrive you know five days from now or a few days from now or whatever it might be a different game that's free that day but uh today uh that game is free and of course they have a bunch of games that are um on sale as well nice i just uh, we just downloaded battlefield battlefront 2 star wars battlefront 2 yeah i did too i gotta pretty awesome I gotta get that. pretty awesome pretty pretty awesome all right thank you paul therati now time for the Enterprise Pick of the Week. In steps, Mary Jo Foley. <laughs> um, our first Enterprise Pick of the Week is all about AI. And we actually didn't talk to Chris that much about AI, but as everybody who watches Microsoft knows, it's a huge priority for them, stepping up their AI game and adding AI to everything. I keep calling it Add AI and Stir. And that's what they did last week. They had a big announcement in San Francisco, and they talked – Uh, at length about the different ways they're adding more artificial intelligence capabilities to Office 365, to Cortana, and Bing. So uh, on the Office 365 side, uh, some of our enterprise readers and consumers too may be interested to know what's coming. Uh, They talked about something called Office Insights that uses Microsoft machine learning technology to analyze Excel spreadsheet data and create things like pivot tables and charts to make it easier for users to digest analytical information directly inside of Office. They also are adding, this is going to be great for me and Paul, they're adding um, a tool to Word called Acronyms. Uh, It's coming first to Word Online in 2018. And so when you go into a document, you can uh, get company-specific information about acronyms uh, to help you, say say you're looking at a Microsoft document, it'll have Microsoft acronyms with help on the side so that you can see what does it mean when they say this acronym. Uh, So that's going to be super handy, not just for people in companies, but for people who watch the companies. And then there's also a feature coming to Word called TAP that will help users find relevant documents, spreadsheets, and other information without having to exit their Word document. So Microsoft's doing more and more of this. They're taking their own machine learning technology. They're taking some of the things they learned with um, bots like Zoe, you know, they, the successor to Tay, the Zoe.ai bot. So they're looking at that and figuring out how to better prompt users to make queries more specific. They're using things like their own Project Brainwave technology on field programmable gate arrays in their data centers to read and process tons of information that then they can go back in and make Bing smarter and make Cortana smarter. So, yeah, there's a, there's a lot coming in the new year uh, in terms of getting more AI into Office 365, Bing, and Cortana. And I That's was, Enterprise Pick. I was worried you'd get through the entire year 2017 without a single Hadoop story. 
I know we had to fix that today, didn't we? <laughs> <laughs> had to add a second enterprise pick just because, you know, we, we want to say one more Hadoop for the year. <laughs> As I put in the show notes, Hadoop, everybody drink. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this is actually a good Hadoop good news story. If you are somebody who uses HD Insight, which is Microsoft's Hadoop service that includes things like Hadoop, HBase, Spark, Storm, all those good big data-ish things. Uh, Microsoft's cutting prices. You don't hear that every day. They're cutting prices up to 52% uh, based on the type of virtual machine that you're using um, in the nodes in your, in your HD Insight cluster. So even though the service is not going to be cut or changed, you're going to pay 52% less. And basically what they're trying to do is go head to head with Amazon. Um, and that's why they're cutting the costs. Uh, they're also cutting costs up to 80% if you're using our server. Um, and our server is very pertinent to people who do data science uh, kinds of workloads using the R language. R. It's a pirate R. language. Yes. Yeah, so good news. Price cuts on Hadoop. Yay. That's the second prize pick. Yep. Now, I think we've all done a good job this year. <laughs> we deserve to end the year with a beer. We do. And we have a good one. This is a very unusual beer. Um, actually sent to me by Ninkasi Brewing um, from Oregon. Oh, my God. It, you've reached Nirvana. They're sending you beer now. They're sending me beer. It they was, contacted yes, me yes. on Twitter. Some people want said, computers. Have, Some yep. people want beer. They're like, we have a beer for you and Windows Weekly listeners because here's what's OMG. here's what's cool. It's a it's an awesome bourbon barrel aged beer. Okay. It's got hazelnuts. Good. It's aged in Woodford Reserve bourbon oh, barrels. Oh, oh, it's got star anise, mm. cocoa nibs. But mm. listen to this. It includes yeast that they sent up into space. Space yeast, and that's why it's called gra ground control. Ground control to drink a beer. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Wow. Yep. Space yeast. So, uh, yeah. Do they space assert yeast. that the space yeast changes it in any way? Send it to uh, space? So they have a whole program. See on their website there, it's got, look at our ground control program. This isn't the first time they brewed that this way and using this kind of yeast. It's a whole like thing that they do at Ninkasi, I guess. Oh, wait a minute. I said I'm under 21. Crap. Uh -oh. uh, <laughs> That's amazing. Now I'm getting the He-Man song for some reason. You're old enough to watch a cartoon. Uh -oh. <laughs> you know, I got a new hobby, clicking the I'm under 21 button on beer sites. You know, I wondered what happened when you did that. <laughs> that is really interesting. It's um, He-Man and his version of a it's classic. It's almost like you got Rickrolled. I did feel like something bad happened there. All right, I was going to the uh, space program. and Right, uh, Ninkasi space program. Yeah, no, I don't know what to do. I'm, I'm, yeah, now you're in trouble because you're going to have to verify your age again. Yes, I am 21. All right, here we go, the space program. Oh, look. That's Purple pretty cool, bear. right? That's really neat. Oh, that's really yeah. good. This is a nice site. Look at this. Ooh. I know. Very I well like done. The other one better. <laughs> Mission one, yep, sending sent brewers to space. space now. Wow. <laughs> yeah. I wonder what it does, though, to the brewers. Yeah. I wonder if it so says it somewhere. I didn't actually get that far what into looking, but... In yeah. a rocket, and we shot it into space. T-minus 30 seconds. Wow. The vehicle is armed. Space-faring yeast. Okay. <laughs> and on that note, <laughs> send Mary Jo more beer. We'll play your <laughs> rap tunes on the air. Yeah. Not every beer will get on. Only the good Only ones. Only the good ones. This sound. I mean, what you described sounded great. I don't know about the space yeast, but everything else yeah. sounded really good. Yeah. <laughs> Mary Jo Foley not only drinks beer uh, for a living now, for a living. <laughs> you have to declare that on your tax. Living the dream, <laughs> Leo. You're living the dream. She also <laughs> writes all about Microsoft for ZDN, and her blog is allaboutmicrosoft.com. And I only can echo what Chris Capicella says about both of you. You guys are the best 
Windows journalists in the business. I don't care about those other Brad, Sams, and Raphael <laughs> Rivera's of the year. I don't care about any of yeah. them. Hey, hey. Wow. But oh, uh, <laughs> Paul Therott, he's at therott.com. His book's leanpub.com. <laughs> Have a great Christmas and a happy new year. It's I think I saw some I snow in Emmaus, PA. Yeah, you did. Oh, wow. On your Instagram feed. I commented to my wife that I think it snowed more already this year here <laughs> than it did all of last winter in Boston. So <laughs> moving south is really working out. <laughs> he goes to the neighbor and says, I, I, I'm a snowbird. I thought it would I be know. warmer yeah, yeah. here. <laughs> there, was, there was some talk of global warming. Could you explain what I'm saying here? You're in PA, maybe. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Well, have a great Christmas. And uh, are the, ki the kids are coming home, right, Paul, both of them? Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. Unfortunately. No, I mean, yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and all the family gather together. Mary Jo, you, I guess you're going to... You said going to see to, Mom. You're going to see Mom. Boston. That's right, in Boston. Yep. Yeah. Have a wonderful yep. time up there. Thanks. That Me means too. you can go to... The brewery in Framingham. Is it Jack's Abbey? Jack's Abbey. That's I nice will place. definitely be there. It's yeah. a nice. really nice place. It's nice to have a hobby. It is. Yeah. <laughs> hobby. Good food there. If, there, you, if there's any, to eat there. any beer I should be drinking in the British Virgin Islands, let me know. Oh, I forgot you're going there. Yeah. yeah. Well, geez. When are you going there? Tomorrow. Wow. So this island obviously was not destroyed. No, uh, it was. No, flattened. Oh, it was. Okay. Flattened. Please. Yeah. Oh. I, I oh. believe the, uh, the description given by... Um, Boris Johnson, <laughs> yeah, was this is the guy from Great yeah, Britain. Yeah, the Great Britain. Yeah. He's a foreign minister. He went mm -hmm. to visit. He says, oh, "My goodness, it looks like Hiroshima." Oh, <laughs> yeah, that must have made them feel good. Minus well, fun. The, um, minus the nuclear waste, <laughs> yeah. of course. But no, they no, they're very anxious. If, uh, uh, yeah. My son's gonna spend another week after we do this in San Juan, and both areas are very anxious to get tourists back there. That's a that's a huge part of the economy. Yeah, that and, I was talking to my wife about Puerto Rico. Same thing. Yeah. Um, you know, you feel like the one way you could kind of help them out, yeah, would be to go. Yep. Mm. So uh, we're gonna we're gonna head down. My son and I are gonna we have a bear boat charter, a catamaran. We're gonna sail around a little oh, bit. Oh wow! Yeah, oh, it's awesome. really fun. I can't wait. Uh, so just a little holiday thing I'll be doing. I'll come back tanned, rested, and ready to do this show January fifth. <laughs> I will not be tan, rested, or ready, but I will yeah. also be there. But I'll bring you a case of Red Stripe, just in case. <laughs> That's Ooh, what you nice. should be drinking. Yeah. Red Stripe's pretty good, right? It is, actually. Yeah. It's is that good. Jamaican? Yep. Yeah, this yep. is like a... Maybe the one legit <clears throat> Caribbean beer that's been around forever. I ordered a case of it put on the boat. It's going to be Ooh, on nice. ice when we get there. That's Very great. Nice. Yep. Uh, all right. Hey, thank you, guys. Have a great thank New you. Year, too. We'll see you in 2018. Don't forget again next week, the best of Windows Weekly. Paul, Mary Jo, I hate to leave you behind. <laughs> but I am. Happy New Year. Merry Christmas. Happy holidays. We'll Thanks. see you next time on Windows Weekly. <laughs> <laughs>